You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you've got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? I am sitting down with Will the Wallace. That's his name on Instagram. His name is Will Wallace. Thank you for being here, Will. Mark, thanks for having me. Absolutely. He's an ingredient scientist who formulates supplements, and he's currently a doctoral candidate. It's good to have you, man. Yeah, man. I appreciate being yeah. here. I mean, it's a Saturday. Got nothing else to do. We're ready to get going. Yeah. So I came across Will's page on social uh, Instagram, and... I started to feed, look through his content, and I was really impressed with all of his content. Um, he heavy into brain health, uh, brain function, brain supplementation, and I immediately thought, I need to know more about this because I don't know enough about it. And I'm going to invite this guy on the show, and he came down, spent this Saturday, a few hours with us, and uh, we're excited to have you. So let's go right into it. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. So my bad, and we were talking about this a little bit before we started rolling, but um, I have an undergraduate degree from Keene State College in New Hampshire in occupational safety and health. So that's OSHA building codes and standards and really absolutely nothing, has absolutely nothing to do with what I do now. Um, but, and I think that it was important for me to do that, to be where I am now, like mm -hmm. most people can see, you know, retroactively thinking. Yeah. Um, but being in a, a career path that I, I knew I, I wanted nothing to do with. I took an interest in exercise science, got my master's degree uh, in exercise and nutrition science from the University of Tampa with a special interest in neuromuscular physiology. Um, and then, you know, I went into, you know, the field of research for a little while where I was and still am in the process of getting my doctorate which I have about five months left, and then I should be all wrapped up with almost that. Almost there, almost there. The light's at the end of the tunnel. It's dim, but it's there. <laughs> um, you know, and I've been working um, also full-time as a, a product developer and supplement formulator. I'm coming from um, exercise and nutrition. Um, and also, you know, like yourself and probably like a lot of people listening to this, like well, most of us are highly interested in supplements because yeah. – they're just they're such a big part of everyday life for so many people mm -hmm. and so initially it was sports supplementation um and as i took more of a keen interest in neuroscience that kind of led me more towards supplementation not only to promote brain health but to promote overall health so i've kind of made the shift from sports science more into health and longevity right. um and but obviously none of those things are mutually exclusive they all work very uh, synergistically together and interact with one another. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of where I am now. Understood, understood. And let's just talk a little bit about supplementation. You know, going through your content, I mean, there was so much information. I mean, and I remember I was looking through the content. I was actually in Whole Foods, and I'm thinking, what should I pick up that can help me with uh, not not necessarily cognitive function, but uh, I guess cognitive function, but brain health, overall brain health concentration because with all these devices you know it's dividing our attention span what would you tell our audience to you know have optimal brain health in regards to supplementation is there a base where to start um, and then we talk about what you take well I think to start and first first off I think that we need to establish what exactly a supplement is mm -hmm. Um, that being, you know, something we include into something else to augment it um, or to increase its efficacy. And so in this case, we're talking about dietary supplements mm -hmm. as supplements. When it comes to, um, you know, what can people take to improve their brain health, I think the most obvious answer is you need to look at everything that your brain needs and is it meeting those requirements first and foremost? And that's talking about all your basic vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. Like those aren't just things that, um, you know, affect every extremity besides your brain. Your brain is one of the most metabolically demanding tissues 
or organs in the body, um, actually the most metabolically demanding. So uh, if every other organ and tissue of your body is going to be concerned with meeting its metabolic needs, so is your brain. So I think looking at basic vitamins and minerals first, making sure that you don't have any inadequ inadequacies there is a good start. Um, I'm obviously like this, this doesn't, this isn't a very exciting answer. Um, but somebody's nutrition should be on point first, right? right you, you don't, yeah, right? It's truth though, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't supplement with something unless you don't really have a more practical means of introducing it into your lifestyle. Like if you're not getting enough fiber in your diet, then obviously increase your intake of foods that contain more soluble and insoluble fibers. But if for some reason you cannot, then you can supplement with it. So I think covering your bases is first and foremost the most important thing, but then moving on from that, what can we take to improve cognition? Mm -hmm. the, mo you know, the next most important thing is asking ourselves, what do we mean by saying improve cognition? Mm -hmm. What does that mean to us? And then establishing something that you actually want out of it because mm -hmm. improving your ability to consolidate information in the form of memory is not the same as being able to recall it quickly. Wow. It's also not being, it's also not the same as being um, extra attentive to stimuli and increasing, you know, the time span of your attention or increasing your mm -hmm. attention span. So we need to look at the different metrics and the different constructs of cognition and see, okay, which ones is it that we want to improve and then go from there because I can't just take this popular supplement that everybody else is taking and then assume it's going to just generally improve my cognition. You actually need to define what that is. Right. And without even getting into supplementation, I think that there's a large part, there's a large population. Well, I know in regards to training, physical fitness, uh, health and wellness, people just devour supplements. Maybe we think about what does the brain need? Hey, I need more memory. I need, need more focus. You know, someone would ask you, and I'm the worst offender. I don't sleep as much as I would like or as much as necessary, and we'll get into that. But if you have get better quality sleep more frequently, well, with consistency, I'm sure that improves your memory. You know? <laughs> it absolutely does yeah. because, you know, I know that uh, surprisingly, I know that a lot of other people might not know that, right. but in terms of sleep science and sleep research, mm -hmm. it's still not completely understood what functions sleep actually serves. We know that um, the maturity of the maturity of circuitry that we've you know acquired over the over our wakeful hours mm -hmm. is one of those things. So, in other words, learning and memory, um, and also returning ourselves to some kind of homeostasis or returning tissues right. in the body to homeostasis. But outside of that, it's not obvious what function sleep serves, but I like to explain it to people like this. Sleep is so important that it is the only time of the day that your body goes and completely disconnects from all of its senses just so that it can have it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And now if we didn't need to have complete sensory disconnect, for those processes to happen, then we would have adapted. We would have adapted that way because, from a survival standpoint, uh, it is not optimal to be completely disconnected from our senses for six to eight hours a night. That leaves us completely vulnerable. So, if we didn't have to have that happen in order to serve whatever function sleep mm -hmm. serves, then it wouldn't happen. That's very interesting. You say completely vulnerable, and of course, we'll speaking to like you're defenseless, and you know years ago, hundreds of years ago, it's, I, I'd imagine why sleep quality, people die young, people die young because they can't be defenseless, they can't be completely vulnerable because they're living in the wild or living, you know, just rough land and they have to be on their toes 24 seven and they're never, never in, you know, parasympathetic, ever, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You have, like you said, like if you're living out in the wild and let's just, the best examples to use are back back during the times when you're being chased by a saber tooth tiger. Right. Um, you know, if if you could have survived to, or if you could have adapted to take care of all the things that sleep takes care of while you're still awake, so that you could be aware of those things and alert of those things, 
then you would have adapted as a human for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be asleep while, you know, the creatures of the night are out looking for you right. as food. Right. And obviously that's not so much the case anymore. However, um, we still haven't gotten to a place uh, where we have found any adequate replacement for sleep. And like you said, there has to be a balance between all these different processes in our brain, parasympathetic mm -hmm. and sympathetic drive right. um, to allow us to maintain homeostasis. And I, exactly. And I think if we if you address that before supplementation, we probably can fix, I, I don't want to say a lot of things, because there's certainly things that you're, you're lacking, as you said, through poor nutrition or lack of proper nutrition. But Sleep is sleep's a, sleep's a big one in regards to performance. Uh, what can we say? Is there a number on sleep, to your knowledge? So, yeah, this is a this is a really hours. We're talking about hours. Yeah, yeah. and this is a pretty you know widely asked question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is the million dollar question. Generally, the range for sleep, the optimal range for sleep, seems to be within the six to eight hour range. Mm -hmm. There is no magic one hour. Mm -hmm. We all function very differently. Um, our circadian rhythms are all, you know, rather constant, but slightly shifted, and that's called your chronotype. But six to eight hours a night is generally what the range is. Anything less than that isn't really going to hurt you acutely, so in a short period of time. And there's research to back that up, showing that over a very short period of time, if you're just getting five hours of sleep a night, it's not really associated with an increase in inflammation, um, like you know, typical sleep deprivation mm -hmm. over a longer period of time is associated with that. And then there's also actually there's actually it's interesting there's research showing that sleep in excess of eight hours, so ten around the ten hour mark, regular sleep is actually associated with worse health outcomes. Wow. Now, and it's, well, I guess we should address this now because it's, it's been talked about actually in a bunch of other podcasts that, or I've heard that information circulating. Um, and I don't think it's so much the extra sleep that is harmful, but think about if somebody is routinely sleeping 10 plus hours, I understand. they probably have other things yeah. going on in their life, um, you know, yeah. that are, probably aren't so good or at least aren't doing them any favors in the term, in terms of health. So yeah. short term a little bit of sleep isn't going to do you do you harm, but six to eight hours is the magic range. That's interesting you say that because if you're sleeping 10 or 11 hours, you're probably not really working. And if you're not working, the chances of you getting up early to train, get some form of exercise is very low. You're probably not eating that well and you have a bunch of lifestyle habits that are negative and that's just a stat or a fact that's in a bucket of negative Human behavioral habits basically yeah. yeah I mean think about if you have like nutrient deficiencies or if somebody's overweight um, they're constantly tired right. probably their body is probably trying to compensate mm -hmm. or reserve its energy because it, it it cannot adequately make energy while you're awake and it's carrying around a backpack of 80 extra pounds of course it's tired right no in no circumstance I know that we do live in a culture where um, everybody's promoting self-love and you know body image and like that's fine you know I'm, I'm on with it at the same time when you look at clinical obesity there are no circumstances I can think of in which it's beneficial and if we're talking about brain health specifically obesity is tightly linked to reduced blood flow in the brain and now if you look at uh, an fMRI of somebody's brain use imaging technology to look at the blood flow in somebody's brain uh, reduced blood flow is the number one predictor for somebody having Alzheimer's disease one day in their life. Reduced. Reduced. Interesting. And, and obviously exercise could combat that and promote positive blood flow or more consistent and quality of blood flow, correct? Absolutely. When you exercise, you increase blood flow to the brain. Mm -hmm. Actually, while well, we're still talking about the obesity in the brain, there's a study that just got published a couple weeks ago also showing that people who are obese have less neurogenesis than people who are non-obese. And essentially what that's telling, now this was an animal model, so you can make the relation from that to a human in that when you're obese, we have something called neurogenesis and we experience it our whole lives and it's our ability to essentially 
take stem cells and have them turn into new neurons so that they can serve whatever function we need them to, whether okay. we're learning new things, new thought patterns, new behaviors. And obesity basically reduces that. And a reduction of that is highly associated with psychopathologies like anxiety and depression. Wow, very interesting. It's very interesting. You, you, you would think that there'd be more of a call to action to save one's brain through fitness, wellness, and exercise. But it, 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 we're, we're certainly not there yet. What, so what's your sleep patterns like? So my sleep patterns, and also I want to preface this by saying, like we see an increased emphasis being put on the importance of sleep. Mm -hmm. However, I also don't believe that it's good to let us get to a point where we're freaking out so much about sleep that we're stressing ourselves out over it. Like right. you see people have like their sleep trackers, um, you know, and they're religious about seeing how they slept and now then they get in their heads about it and maybe Ooh. their sleep suffering because they're being too meticulous about it. Oh yeah, if, so, you, if I get the whoop on and it's telling you you're not recovered, you can't train. Yeah, you're like, what the hell? Yeah. And then you stress out that night, am I going to sleep well? Yeah. And you know, you're an athlete, so you, you can psych yourself out, you know? Oh yeah. Um, and so I do think, you know, back in the day, um, people woke up when the sun came up and they went to bed when the sun went down. So I think we need to have like a, we should basically take care of our sleep hygiene, mm -hmm. but also I do think we should have a, a semi relaxed state about it. But are there things that we can do to improve our sleep hygiene? Absolutely. So things that I do, um, because we're talking about exercise, mm -hmm. I like to keep my exercise in the morning or in the first part of the day. I know that that's not possible How for all people. How early are we talking about? Well, for me, I'm, I'm an early bird, so I get up at around the five or six hour, okay. and then I just get to it before my body tells me that it doesn't want to do it. Understood. Because that's also pretty routine. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with exercising in the afternoon, late afternoon, even early evening, mm -hmm. but what you don't want to do is exercise too close to the time that you should be going to sleep because you increase core body temperature and one of the ways the body helps to prepare, one of the natural circadian ways your body prepares itself for sleep is reducing core body temperature. So anything you do at night to keep body temperature high isn't really doing you a whole lot of favors mm -hmm. in getting to sleep. So sometimes what I like to do is, and actually there's also research supporting this, is taking a hot shower um, an hour or two, excuse me, an hour or two before I go to sleep. What that does is it actually helps pull blood to the surface mm. and then over the next hour or two it helps with heat dissipation out of the body which can help cool core body temperature right. so yeah i think showers i believe in in the research that was summed up it was somewhere there was a range of about 104 to 108 degrees fahrenheit for as little as 10 minutes improved sleep parameters in most people super interesting super interesting and you were saying that I Let's talk about, let's close the book or the chapter rather on sleep. Naps, good for the brain? Naps are good for the brain. Um, however, I, I don't like naps because mm -hmm. they just screw me up. Mm -hmm. They really screw me up. I have a hard time getting going after yeah. it. But if somebody isn't sleeping adequately, then naps are something you can do to maybe, maybe chip away at some of that deficit. But at the same time, you have to look at the length of the nap. Um, you know, you're not, you're probably not getting the highest quality sleep and also for a long enough duration of time because you have to look at sleep magnitude as a thing. That's why it's so important to optimize that nighttime period where you have hours to sleep mm -hmm. is because not only do you have to take care of the duration you're asleep, but there's a certain quality of sleep that you need to achieve. I mean, the deep stages of sleep or you have stage three and four, so mm -hmm. deep sleep and then REM sleep, which is more dream, dreamlike. Mm -hmm. There's very important processes that happen um, during that time to a promote learning, but also uh, promote general brain health by clearing away debris. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really happen unless you reach those stages of sleep. So if you're depriving yourself of sleep, like four or five hours a night, and like, it's cool, I'm taking a half an hour nap during the day. Odds are you're not getting enough quality sleep to actually keep yourself functioning at an optimal level, at least not long term. It's very interesting. Thus, you know, we, I heard it on the Joe Rogan podcast. He had a guest on. He said people who sleep less 
die young. It's a fact. Yeah, and actually, this is so. This is really interesting because it doesn't kind of corroborate this. Is the animal research that was published earlier this year actually shows that death from sleep deprivation is a thing. Um, now, obviously, it's it's not ethical to mm-hmm. sleep deprive a human to anywhere close to that point, mm-hmm. um, but you can do it to animals, or cer- certain animals, right? So there's there are mouse models um, and also fruit flies because their lifespan is so short, so you can see what happens over the course of their life. If you sleep deprive them enough, they die. And the old theory was, okay, well, it must have something to do with the brain because the neurons and actually new research was just published literally two weeks ago showing that astrocytes, another type of cell in the brain, um, are responsible for sleep. So if, if you're not sleeping, it must be damage to those things that's mm-hmm. causing the death. Um, what's interesting, though, is that sleep deprivation doesn't really seem to have much of an impact on brain cells, at least not in terms of damaging them. Mm-hmm. And so what the researchers found was that as you become more sleep deprived, inflammation actually starts building up in your gut, so in your GI tract. And it, it's that those reactive oxygen species that build up over time that then start to wreak havoc on the body. Because as we now know and are starting to understand more and more of, your gut is just like any other organ in the body and they all communicate with one another. And because so many things go through your gut, like people are calling it another brain, a second brain. And the reactive oxygen species that build up there, they then start to spread to other parts of the body and they wreak havoc on other organ systems. And that's what essentially caused the death. So basically these researchers started supplementing these fruit, again, they're fruit flies, so it's just a model, but they were supplementing these fruit flies with things like melatonin, N-acetylcysteine, lipoic acid, and NAD. And what they were showing is that by reducing inflammation in the gut, they were essentially able to restore these flies' lives back to their normal lifespan. Though they weren't functioning the way they probably should have been, they were able to increase their longevity by keeping gut inflammation lower that was due to sleep deprivation. So now everyone listening, we understand why the world has gone fanatical about having positive gut health. Yeah, right. basically. Yeah. Um, so I guess we can uh, venture into eating in eating and for, for brain health. Um, what, what other than we talked about it a little bit off camera, you know, why it's good to, it's not just, you need certain nutrients in the body and you were touching on that. Um, not just be, it's not just for training purposes, but it's also to keep the brain healthy. What's optimal eating for brain health or what does that look like? So, Again, I guess we have to establish like what optimal is. Mm-hmm. Is it allowing us to is it allowing us to sustain continuous cognitive processes for as long and as safely as possible? Is it staving off degeneration that happens with aging? Um, and I personally think that it might be a combination of all those things. I know that we can't really be it's not practical to think that we can operate at peak levels all the time. Right. However, there was, there was research that was published very recently showing that to have the most protective effects um, of the most protective effects of nutrition for the brain, that they basically took people and they they put them in different quartiles of okay these are the amount of polyphenols they're eating a week this these are the amount of you know fibers fruits mm-hmm. grains like what have you, and when they started to look at the people's Alzheimer's disease risk they basically showed that when you did the math out and looked at it weekly, that the people who had the highest protection against neurodegenerative diseases, it was like, you know, you have to have at least three cups of berries a week, at least two or three apples, two or three pears, just to get like the optimal amount of like poly- right. polyphenols that comes with those things. It's like, wow, that's, that's tremendously practical. Right, like if you just gave that information to most people who don't even like doing those things, like oh, I could eat two apples a week, right. I could have a couple right. handfuls of berries a week, like that's no big deal. And so, doing little things like that, especially when you put it in terms for people where it is very practical, it has to be practical, otherwise people aren't going to do it. You know, and like not everybody is like you or myself who mm-hmm. are 
probably slightly neur- neurotic in nature and will do whatever it takes to That's achieve accurate. to achieve yeah. a certain outcome, you know, but uh, I think that those like those things just like getting certain polyphenols um, and, and knowing that you don't have to do it every single day or be so meticulous about doing it with every meal. Mm. But as long as you're doing it a set amount of times a week, then you probably are doing yourself, you're probably far more ahead than most people are in terms of their nutrition and how it's impacting their brain health. Understood. You know, that leads me into, I was, I was reading uh, some material on uh, calorie restriction or caloric restriction dieting um, and how it actually can help longevity. What's the correlation to brain health and brain activity with calorie restriction or is there? Okay, so cal and this is a whole this is a whole other beast because mm-hmm. there's a couple things that happen with calorie restriction. Firstly, mm-hmm. we shut down anabolic processes that are energy consuming in nature. And we kickstart restorative processes that are energy producing in nature. We activate a bunch of longevity pathways. And it's interesting that you bring this one up because this is something that really wasn't, it really wasn't known until now. And now it needs to be understood. And that's that just the calorie restriction alone is fine, but it's things that come along with that that really drive some of the longevity benefits. And it was basically just very recently found that a drop in core body temperature that happens with calorie restriction is in part what drives the longevity benefits of calorie restriction. And when you put animals, say, inside of an atmosphere where they weren't able to reduce core body temperature Mm -hmm. with a calorie-restricted diet, inflammation never subsided like like it should have. And what they found was essentially you have a temperature shift. There's a temperature gradient that's established between the surface of an organism and then the ambient, the ambient temperature. Uh, and when you sense the gradient, then you'll start to drop in body temperature a bit. But once that happens, there's a lot of metabolites that are released in the body from proteins and lipids or fats. And those metabolites are actually activators of a lot of these longevity pathways and they also help drive physiologically drive a reduction in core body temperature so not only is the reduced core body temperature a response to a temperature gradient but it's a physiological outcome that is achieved by getting this signaling if that makes sense but when you're in an atmosphere where say it's a really warm atmosphere you're not allowing that initial drop in temperature to happen then three quor- then these metabolites, some of which I believe it was, it was shown that a quarter of them in the body are dependent on temperature, not just calorie restriction. So if the temperature is too warm, those metabolites won't be released, and then you won't further drive core body temperature. And especially the hypothalamus, the part of the brain that actually controls or regulates body temperature, mm-hmm. three quarters of the metabolites that circulate in response to calorie restriction in that area of the brain, uh, three quarters of those are temperature dependent, meaning if it's too warm, you don't get those metabolites and then you don't get them to signal for the drop in core body temperature and then you don't get some of the longevity benefits. Now, again, this research is shown in animals and right now the theory is that those longevity benefits come from the drop in body temperature because of energy restriction and energy reservation. And I do think that there needs to be more things looked at and understood because a lot of these metabolites that are circulating are probably also working on and activating longevity and longevity pathways and tissue repair pathways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I also don't think that like people don't need to worry. Like if you're walking around in a sweatshirt and trying to keep yourself warm from being calorie restricted, um, you know, don't worry. It's like you're not killing yourself slowly. Right, um, right. These are this is definitely just research in animals where you put them in an, an environment where it's too warm for them to cool down. But because calorie restriction does offer those longevity benefits, we have to take the things that come with it. And if we feel a little chilly, then that's that's kind of part of what comes with it, and that might be a driver of the longevity benefits. Understood. Understood. Uh, along the lines of nutrition, will. Talk, can you 
speak to the damaging effects of sugar or excess sugar for the brain? So I don't, I don't think that sugar in itself is going to be highly damaging to the brain. I think it's the things that excess sugar can cause that are damaging to the brain. Okay. So we talk about people being becoming insulin resistant, um, developing obesity. Those types of things are going to be damaging to the brain. So it's the indirect impact of too much sugar, but not sugar itself that's really going to cause any type of toxicity in brain cells, at least probably not in the concentrations that people are normally normally taking it in but i do think that the insulin resistance and the obesity and things of that nature that come with too much sugar intake that's what's going to hurt brain health more so than the sugar itself okay okay understood well we know we people most people put sugar in coffee uh, what the the overall concentration benefits we know that coffee helps us and it may seem sim sim simplistic but is there I used to drink a lot of coffee. I stopped drinking coffee altogether. But I was drinking so much coffee and I supplement, supplemented um, or sh swat, swapped out coffee for tea. Green tea, matcha, and I know the world's on a matcha uh, craze, but instead of drinking three coffees, now I have nine matchas a day. Yikes. So um, I know there's theanine in matcha, correct? Yeah, I believe so. Theanine, okay, and are you a coffee person or a tea person? Both. 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 Well, let's talk about your habits and maybe that could take us uh, where we need to go. Okay, so this one's an interesting one because I actually, I just got this actually. Um, it was a question on my Instagram yesterday. I do like Q&As mm -hmm. every, every now and again. You got to follow Will's Instagram, by the way. It's awesome. Awesome. Seriously, awesome content. Thank you. Yeah, man. Um, somebody asked me, like, what's the, like, I actually got a couple questions about caffeine yesterday. It was interesting. One of them was like, what's better, like, what's better coffee from, um, or caffeine from coffee or caffeine from from tea and another one was is coffee ever ever good for you or should it be avoided at all costs i love this question which i thought was see it like you're like i love this question and in my head like i'm like that's a ridiculous question but then I, I think about it i'm like you know that's probably a good question for a lot of people mm -hmm. um who at least just don't know the things that, that i know about right. the topic so firstly um we'll go to the first question you know caffeine from coffee or caffeine from tea or, or just coffee or tea which one's better the answer is i mean they're both different caffeine is caffeine and caffeine caffeine itself actually has a lot of benefit it actually can be highly neuroprotective we know that it raises alertness uh, it's one of the it's one of the only three things that have been shown to raise cognition in say a sleep deprived state but it can also be protective against things like parkinson's disease okay. Yeah, I mean, there's studies showing that up to three cups of coffee a day or that benefit against something like Parkinson's comes at about three cups of coffee a day. And mm -hmm. A, both coffee, so let's rewind a little bit to the coffee or tea. Caffeine is caffeine, mm -hmm. and it's the same from any source you get it from. However, the additional constituents that you get with it in the form of polyphenols or other active ingredients are going to be different depending on the form that you get it in, whether it's from the coffee bean or whether it's from green tea. Like you said, you're going to be getting things like L-theanine, epigallocatechin gallate or EGCG um, from green tea, whereas from coffee, you know, you're going to be getting, you're going to be getting other things sometimes like, let's see, gallic acid is one of them, but... Mm -hmm. So different types of polyphenols and active ingredients are going to come with each one. And then you just have to ask yourself, well, do I have certain limitations on caffeine that I've set for myself? And, and what are those? And obviously caffeine concentrations are probably going to be higher in coffee. But at the same time, like so for myself personally, I limit myself to 300 milligrams a day. And those are my high days. And those are also days that I train. And so like I'll take Before a- training. Before training, yeah, you take it with you. I'll take I'll take about two hundred to two hundred fifty milligrams before training. In what form? Actually, in a, in a pre workout. Which one? Well, I don't buy I don't actually buy um, pre made pre workouts. I kind of I just make I make my own. I just and I just put together a very simple thing. I like I like to control the dosing mm -hmm. myself, but so caffeine 
200 to 250 milligrams. And I try to do it first thing in the morning so that it doesn't disrupt my sleep. Mm -hmm. But I also will have tea in the afternoon to kind of pick myself up from that mid-afternoon slump. Right. That drop in alertness that that most most of us experience around this time of the day. But I try not to let myself have caffeine past the hour of 3 p.m. Because caffeine tends to have a half-life of anywhere from 2.5 up to 6 hours, depending on how you metabolize it and also what other lifestyle factors you have going on. Say, if, if you're a smoker, nicotine actually increases the metabolism of caffeine, meaning that it, it might be it might be harder for you to limit your caffeine because you're going to crash pretty soon thereafter. Or if you're a female on oral uh, oral birth control, you will prolong the life of caffeine. Interesting. So it's important to understand those things when we're regulating caffeine intake. But caffeine does confer a lot of health benefit. So in excess, we know that it's not good for you. We know that people can't, I mean, like most things, but we know that also it gets to a point where you can't really function without a set amount of it. So it's good to use it as a tool, but to also keep your body in a state where it's not independence of it and where you can, you can apply it when necessary to achieve a certain outcome, right? Like if you need to st- stimulate yourself enough for a workout or a podcast, but you don't need it to just walk around and take care of activities of daily living. Understood. Is there a... Um... What's the caffeine overdose number? The caffeine overdose is there, number. Is it like 500 milligrams, 600, 800? Because I, I used to drink a lot of coffee, and then later on in the day, I was feeling things like my, my eyes hurt, my face was like tingly. Um, I was insanely irritable. I'm like, dude, I'm caffeine overdose, and that's exactly what it is. And I, it, I was aloof to it. I didn't realize. I mean, it wasn't like I was consuming five pot, pots of coffee, and there's a whole how it affects our adrenals. Um, but I was taking in, you know, two to three espressos in the morning, early in the morning. And then by nine o'clock, I was uh, having a cup of coffee. And then later on in the day, I have another espresso. And all in, I was probably about 7, 800 milligrams of caffeine when I realized this is horrible for my body. I'm feeling the effects of it. And is there a specific number that we could speak to or not necessarily? So the number does shift from person to person, but generally, what I tell people is that if you're operating at somewhere around the ballpark of close to a gram a day, so a a thousand milligrams, then that's no good. And you should probably start finding ways to taper back. Now, if you look at individual, like individual dosing, because obviously you can accumulate, you know, however, however much amount of caffeine over the course of a day, but in a single dose, what's too much. And if you look through research in terms of like cognitive function and cognitive testing, people tend to see increases in performance anywhere up to 500 milligrams at a time. And 500 milligrams is a lot. So those aren't people that are going to be naive to caffeine. If you're naive to caffeine and you take 500 milligrams, you're probably not going to feel very well. You're probably going to have to do that sit and pray for a little while and just kind of ride it out. But... At the same time, when you start approaching that number and then past it in a single dose, you see pretty intense drops in cognitive function and even drops past what you would have at baseline with no caffeine. That's something called the Yerkes-Dodson law where um, alertness or increase in alertness up to a point will improve performance. But if you apply the stimuli any much farther past that, then you you see drops because of overstimulation. Understood. Okay. I, this probably isn't going to be a popular answer for most people because like I, I really am when it comes to these things quite boring. Okay. I, I like to just do like, I like to get maximum benefit out of minimal, minimal input. And maybe that's my lazy side talking um, because I do that with a lot of things. But, <laughs> but when it comes to, when it comes to pre workouts also, I don't like just throwing a lot of shit in my body just for the sake of throwing it in my body. Mm-hmm. But caffeine is, caffeine is the base for me, um, and that's for me in my life, right? To any, if other people don't want to do caffeine, then there's alternatives that can increase alertness. But for me, like I'm fine with caffeine. Mm-hmm. I have a good relationship with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I take, I try to go actually most weekends without it. So I, I'm pretty good with cycling periods off. And, you haven't and, had any today? 
Um, let's see. I did have a little bit today, but only in the form of green tea. So oh, understand, I, understand. I had two cups of green tea, so I'm probably sitting. Yeah, we'll let that go. That doesn't count. Yeah, it doesn't count. <laughs> so I'm. I mean, I'm sitting at like a hundred milligrams of caffeine today. Oh, that's today. pretty low. And I won't. And I won't have any more for the rest of the day. So, but, but hold on. Be honest with me. When you, if you have it Monday through Friday, you don't have it on Saturday. You must feel like not a withdrawal, but you must feel not as good. Actually, not necessarily mm-hmm. because I. I I kind of work myself to the bone so much during the week that I sleep so well when I know that I don't have anything else to do the next day. Okay. Like at least the next morning, I don't right. have to be up at 5 a.m. So I sleep so well on those weekend nights that that's the that's a boost in alertness enough because I can keep my caffeine intake low enough. Like I don't train every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I train I train hard four days a week, with resistance training, and then I do cardio two days a week mm-hmm. and that's normally on the days that i'm also resistance training so i have plenty i have plenty of rest days okay. in between and on those rest days i'm not taking in close to 300 milligrams of caffeine like i wake up and i have a cup of coffee um after i've been awake for about two hours mm-hmm. and then in the afternoon i have another cup of coffee or in most cases a green tea i mm-hmm. like to have a, like a combination of I mix green tea and spearmint tea because there's also a lot of a lot of health benefits with spearmint. Right, uh, and that's my afternoon pick me up. And so, I mean, that on days I'm not training, that has me at I don't know, 150 to 200 milligrams maximum of caffeine a day. So when I take days off of caffeine, I really don't feel it. I don't feel like a negative impact, mm-hmm. right? Like maybe if I'm sitting down and I'm trying to study, um, do intense studying or intense reading, I mm-hmm. might realize that. I'm having a harder time kind of grasping what's going on or mm-hmm. it's easier for me to drift off and into oblivion, but it's not so bad um, that I just can't live without it. And okay. I also like, you know, the everybody knows the, the dreaded caffeine withdrawal, like the headaches, um, the headaches that you get from- your, I get headaches, I do. Oh yeah, your adenosine receptor is trying to like oh, restabilize yeah. themselves, okay. but that normally doesn't happen, at least unless Unless you are like chronically, like you have been taking high doses of caffeine for long periods of time, Mm -hmm. you're not really going to suffer those headaches with one day off. Now, if I were to take two or three days off of caffeine on that third day, I might feel like mild head pains Mm -hmm. and it'll last a day, two maximum, and then it's done with. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody who's has say, we could classify as maybe a caffeine addiction without caffeine in one day like then you could experience headaches and you can even trigger migraines okay okay and there's got to be a way a way to wean yourself off that meaning like just ease back in the caffeine if i'm taking 300 milligrams and slowly i take it back down to like 150 or 100 on that third day i probably wouldn't have headaches because i've reduced the caffeine over a period of time would that be correct yeah and just be systematic about it okay. like it's never wise to cut anything cold turkey right that you're that you have a physical dependence to mm-hmm. and i mean this is like slightly off topic but you see this in different countries that are trying this trying you know with rehabilitation centers that are trying to bring people on drug addiction back into real life is that mm-hmm. they're not just taking the drugs away they're actually being very systematic about the process and tapering. They're actually giving them the drugs they're addicted to, but they are tapering them down at a pace where the body can handle it and where it's manageable. And when you're not really going to notice the negative side effects like you would otherwise. And so it's allowing these people to come down off of drugs. Mm -hmm. And also like they're getting the drug in these cases, they're getting the drugs from doctors. So Mm -hmm. they're, you know, quote unquote clean, you know, you're not getting them with any added constituents and, you know, you're effectively able to wean people off of substances that they are physically dependent on if you're systematic about it. So Mm -hmm. if you don't know how much caffeine you're taking in a day, write it down in a journal, keep notes on your phone, you know, Mm -hmm. just realize, okay, I had this amount, this cup of coffee was probably roughly, you know, X amount of caffeine. I had four of those a day. Then I I had a pre-workout. It had this much caffeine. And then add it up and then just give yourself a ballpark. Say, okay, I was today, I had 500 to 600 milligrams of caffeine Mm -hmm. somewhere in that ballpark. And then you just establish what is the rate at which you can taper that down in a very systematic manner and still be able to function appropriately. So maybe say, okay, every week I'm going to taper it down 100 milligrams a week. And then instead of having 500 milligrams every day, I'll have 400 milligrams every day the next week and then 300 every day. 
And then maybe you have a period where you reach none and then you just go a week or two without caffeine just to say, I'm capable. And then you reintroduce it how you will without going over the top and establishing another physical dependence. Got it. Understood. And I see the fitness training, uh, you know, weightlifting performance culture now is so heavily dependent on pre-workouts. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was playing sports in high school, um, high school, college, professionally, I never took anything before a game. It was like, get yourself up, let's go. I, I know professional athletes that drink a whole C4 before the game and at halftime. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm thinking, this is, that's got to be crushing your your organs, your body, your central nervous system, you got to be like in shock. I don't understand what's going on. Like, so what? what's the downside? So I guess the downside to a lot of it is most people aren't paying attention to what else is coming in the, coming with those things outside mm -hmm. of caffeine. Right. I mean, we've kind of, we've touched on at least some of the negative side effects of too much caffeine. Um, you know, one of the biggest side effects is obviously if you spend so much time in a, in a sympathetic or aroused state, mm -hmm. then it, over time you're going to drive up inflammatory processes and then even further down the road, you may have an inadequate stress response, which is maladaptive, which is something we can maybe get into in a minute. Mm -hmm. But to rewind a little bit, you also, you just don't know what else you're getting within those supplements. Like I went, so I'll give you a good example. Um, I actually went, I'm doing my grocery shopping at Walmart a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. And typically like, I, you know, I buy like bulk powders or individual supplements and, and I, I dose things myself because most times in pre-workouts, you're also not getting an efficacious dose of one thing. You mm -hmm. get like a million things and that looks very all well and good, mm -hmm. but you're not getting one thing that's dosed where it should be outside of caffeine to actually like confer some kind of benefit. I'm sorry, let me rudely interrupt here. Can we? Can you just correct me if I'm wrong? I used to work with a supplement company and the supplement com uh, market, the supplement industry in general, Who's policing what's in those supplements? Okay, so there's a lot of misconceptions. Yeah, yeah, a lot of misconceptions when it comes to this. Now, people do like they like to say that there's there's no regulation, which is not entirely true. Mm. The FDA does regulate these things. However, there is a low bar to entry. There is a low bar to entry for mm. a lot of it, and the way that regulatory federations work they're not going to be as strict on dietary supplements as they are with pharmaceutical grade supplements, mm -hmm. obviously. So the FDA, they really can't take any action against something until it's already out on the market. They don't really police things before they hit the market. And even then things can get by for a pretty long period of time without, without getting the recognition they need to be taken off shelves. And a good example of that is the sports nutrition the sports nutrition field and which is one reason why I've been so turned off to it as of late is because mm -hmm. there are all these unique ways in which sport nutrition companies are trying to promote say pre-workouts with these nifty ingredients that are going to you know in their words like mimic Adderall or something mm -hmm. and the ingredients they're using to achieve such things are on the FDA's list of not banned substances but they're on a warning list which is essentially a uh, hey we don't know enough about these things mm -hmm. like we shouldn't be using them and if people see them in products it's a good idea to just stay away for now because there's not enough human data there's not enough animal data there's not enough safety data mm -hmm. and so we don't know what these things are doing to the body long term but the sports nutrition you know feel that these ingredients like i still see them pop up all over the place they're still they're products that have been on the market for a long time with these types of ingredients there are products that are coming out with these ingredients still. And, and that's the biggest issue is that, or the biggest issue that some people have is that there's not tight enough regulation, mm -hmm. which you have to look at the multiple sides that be like, you know, if you're in this industry, like I am, be like how tight do you want the regulation to be? And there's an argument to be had there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's giving people too much credit to, to think that they can educate themselves appropriately 
on mm-hmm. these things. Right. So there is regulation in this field. The problem is, is that nothing can be regulated. At least dietary supplements are not regulated until they reach the market. And even then there's no guarantee oh. that they won't fly under the, that something that shouldn't be there will fly under the radar for mm-hmm. long enough. There's no guarantee it will be mm-hmm. pulled soon enough. Dangerous, really dangerous. Um, so I don't know if I asked citrulline. Citrulline effect effects on the brain. And I know I've talked about blood flow, obviously, but specifically to the brain. So I'm not aware of any data looking at citrulline's effects on blood flow to the brain. However, because it's providing substrate for mm-hmm. the NO pathway, mm-hmm. the traditional NO pathway, then it probably does have some beneficial effect there, especially when you're using it in conjunction with exercise. Citrulline is one of the things that I, one of the boring things in my in my head that I add to my pre-workouts because okay. it's not the most exciting thing. It's not incredibly novel, mm-hmm. but it works. Uh, is there, the, what are the dangers of uh, too much citrulline or are there? To my knowledge, I'm not sure that there are dangers to too much. Now, probably taking excess amounts of citrulline is not going to be good, but it does have a pretty high safety profile. And most of us know that three to six grams is where you see most of the benefits of just L-citrulline. Citrulline malate is a little bit different because it's citrulline combined with malic acid. Okay. And say that you have, I can't remember the ratio, I believe it, it might be a two to one citrulline to, to malic acid. Okay. But so if you have six grams of that, then that's not all citrulline. But if we're just talking about L-citrulline, three to six grams is the standard standard dose for that. Understood. So it has a good safety profile. Like most things, you probably don't want to take too much. Um, I did think there was really interesting animal research that came out two years ago looking at citrulline. And it was actually, now this was like an, a, a mouse model of obesity, but mm-hmm. basically what they gave them citrulline to see if, okay, by, if, by improving NO levels, can we give these obese mice some kind of like positive cardiovascular outcomes? Mm-hmm. And what they showed was that citrulline actually caused more insulin resistance when taken long term, but wow. it, but you actually have to look at the the specific muscles it caused it. And so, mm-hmm. in muscles that were the the gastroc, so the the main calf muscle, mm-hmm. um, that is more fast twitch in nature. The fibers are more fast twitch, so it operates more what we call glycolytically. Mm-hmm. And in that muscle in obese mice, it caused more insulin resistance. However, in the soleus, which is the the more minor of the calf muscles, which is more fast twitch, so it's more oxidative, mm-hmm. it didn't cause insulin resistance there because it, you know it's more efficient at using oxygen and things of that nature. So citrulline, now again, if somebody's obese, does that mean that taking citrulline for long periods of time is not going to be good for them. Like, no, that's not necessarily the case. Like we know that if you put citrulline and you look at it in a, um, like cell data on citrulline shows that it stimulates insulin release in beta cells. So beta cells are the cells of the pancreas that release insulin. So citrulline may release insulin when you put it in the body. And now you say long-term, if I'm doing that, is that gonna be good for me? Maybe not, so we should be cautious about Mm -hmm. it. Um, but all the data so far is in animals. And also you would probably be have, having to take something like citrulline like multiple times during the day because you know, things like that, you know, they only work for short periods of time. Hence, we take citrulline before workout, but right. we never tend to think of it any time outside of that. Right. Understood. Okay. So uh, is there a, well, I wanted to cover like some of the uh, recovery modalities like infrared sauna, um, maybe cold plunging, cold pool. Uh, they have any specific effects on the brain that you, you'd like to mention? So, yeah, I mean, I'll like... You know, and by the way, also, Will, I'm so sorry, sleeping with a infrared or a red light. Sleeping with a red light? Yeah. Like over your head? Yeah, I, well, I've been told that uh, red light therapy in, during sleep can be incredibly beneficial and therapeutic. I don't know about during sleep. Okay. Now, also, when when you look at photo photo biomodulation and studies Mm -hmm. you know obviously unless you're looking at things like um you know you say recovery from a workout Mm -hmm. or things of that nature which you can do in people a lot of times 
this is animal research because you know you can either expose somebody to or say a red light or you know you can basically take the red light and put it inside their brain and actually you know because you have to breach the skull mm -hmm. but there are benefits to photobiomodulation it just you know what are they and you know we have different colors of light that we respond differently to and a lot of the hype behind red light therapy is highly overblown especially for what's it's now i'm not saying it's not present there mm -hmm. are benefits to it just right. the the claims that let's say people that are selling red lights make yeah. now it can be very beneficial for say improving or improving recovery outcomes from exercise mm -hmm. that's been shown it can help reduce inflammatory levels okay. within the body. So all of those things, uh, those things, it can confer benefit through those ways. However, oh, actually, also, there was another study showing that in older people, it did help improve eyesight when administered at a certain time of the day. I okay. believe it was earlier in the day. But outside of that, uh, I think that the claims behind red light therapy do need to be a little bit more cautious, but for the purpose of recovery from exercise, it could be a useful modality. Okay. Terrific. Cold. Uh, I, I jump in the cold plunge and with the Wim Hof craze and all the cold therapy, everyone's trying to get a cold plunge in their backyard, including myself. Um, thank God we can do it at anatomy. Um, is there any research that stimulation of the brain or therapeutic benefits of cold plunging? Um, so yes and yes. There's actually, you know, we can also look at some of the say not so good benefits. Oh, yeah, say please. not so good benefits, but not so good sides to it, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. In terms of benefits from the brain, yeah, it's been shown that by taking ice baths mm -hmm. or cold showers, you can actually improve immune functioning or improve your immune resistance to. Uh, disease or infection wow. but also you know you get a stimulation of things like dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain which are highly beneficial for concentration and alertness which is why you hear the recommendation nowadays of right, just take a cold shower in the morning right. and replace that with a cup of coffee yeah that's fun cold shower in the morning it's yeah it's miserable you know <laughs> i think you literally just kind of suck it up and do that one every now and again if i'm feeling ambitious i'll just kind of like turn the dial yeah. down all the way and just take it for about 30 seconds yeah, exactly. that's, um, that's a long 30 seconds right there. it is but it works yeah yeah it works um so cold therapy can be highly beneficial from an alertness standpoint um, it can also be highly beneficial in reducing inflammation but when we get into recovery from exercise we also need to take into account the goals of the individual because it can also blunt adaptation it can blunt adaptation from exercise thank you which yeah we know thank that you. yeah we know that the inflammatory response from exercise is those things are sending signals for a positive adaptation whether that be from muscle growth or whatever right and if you blunt that too quickly then you're not getting the signals to repair regenerate and right. grow if that's your goal thank you so much for jumping into that so Everyone thinks that, yeah, hey, man, I'm going to hit that cold plunge right after. Cold plunge is an amazing tool, but as Will said, for what for? You know, if my goal is to shred muscle fibers and hypertrophy, it might not be the best to jump in post-workout. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. If hypertrophy is your goal, probably not. Now, mm -hmm. if fat loss is your goal, I still don't know that I would do it immediately post-workout, mm -hmm. but maybe in the morning would be that might be beneficial for actually fat loss and you know cre so interesting. creating an increase in lipolysis in the body so there was a guy that came to our Miami Beach location and he would do 45 minutes neck down in the cold plunge no thanks three times a week he lost 70 pounds yikes he watched what he he, he, he paid attention to his nutrition he didn't exercise mm -hmm. he lost 70 pounds yeah i mean it can be a highly beneficial tool um and honestly if it was more practical i would probably do it more often mm -hmm. but i'm not going to take the time every week to go down to the store and get a bunch of bags of ice and then fill up my tub know, know. and then you know so it's, yeah. it's not practical for a lot of people like a right. cold shower but even now the place that i'm at now the shower doesn't get cold enough right. to which i would think that it confers any of those benefits it's very interesting you say that because i always try to put the shower on cold in south florida and it really doesn't get that cold. However, yeah. if you go to Boston and you put a cold shower Different on. Different story. You're going to get your money's worth, man. You just step outside. No. And wear shorts. <laughs> right. Right. 
Okay, uh, training. Is there a specific training? Is there a specific training, i.e., cardio resistance training, or cognitive training, visual training that's highly beneficial for the body? I know they all have wonderful uh, upside, but is there anything right now trending that has a just an amazing return in your investment in regards to specific training? Well, I think just like you said, like each one of them confer their own benefit mm -hmm. and we, we talked a little bit off off mic about these things but something like skill skill based training mm -hmm. so something that's more complex than you know repetitive motions that you use with a barbell and mm -hmm. learn very quickly but skill based training activates your brain much more highly than other types of exercise mm -hmm. and it actually does a better job at stimulating the growth of say new neurons and then new pathways between neurons whereas strength training also has its own benefits in that it helps sensitize say, certain neurotransmitter receptors so that there's more efficient signaling and then cardiovascular work helps increase what we call angiogenesis so the formation of new blood vessel, new blood vessels in the body and in the brain mm -hmm. that you know helps with obviously improving blood flow. You get more oxygen, more nutrients, mm -hmm. uh, and the overall just better function and communication of things. So each one has their own benefits. Uh, it's like it's like the most boring answer in the world. But no, like it's, always, not. It's, it's, it's not. It's it's it depends on the goals of the individual. And wasn't there a couple of things? So there's almost like a backdoor way to if you change. I mean, I. It goes without saying, change the stimulus, you might you get more feedback, more response, more challenging for the body. That way the body grows. But in regards to creating new neurons, that's in essence how we're going to strengthen our bodies, um, not just doing traditional strength work, but placing different and diverse stimulus on the body is going to actually help you get stronger a little bit faster, correct? Potentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's going to help your learn. It's going to help your learning efforts. You know, it's it. it helps promote what we call neural mapping mm -hmm. creating different pathways in the brain and also you know like we used the example a little while ago say you know doing lunges and having somebody you know mm -hmm. toss a tennis ball to you to where you're having to not only pay attention to your lunges and not hurting yourself while doing those but you're having to respond to a stimulus so uh, effectively in that scenario you're having to effectively multitask which later on in life an increase in your ability to do things like that not lunge and catch a tennis ball but be able to multitask say walk and something as simple as walk and talk to somebody at the same time and your ability to walk faster while talking to somebody at the same time mm -hmm. those things are highly associated with reduced frailty and that slower walking speeds when you're talking to somebody because you just can't pay attention to everything at once that's much more highly tied to dementia, increased frailty, and actually an increased rate of all-cause mortality. That's interesting. It's almost like the multitask training, and I'm thinking of visual training, and how we sometimes can use visual training to assist imbalances or biomechanical imbalances. Meaning you can, if I focus on loading my, if I'm doing a, I do this often, if I'm doing a single arm dumbbell row, and I force my weight into my left foot to balance the body out because the load is in my right hand, but I'm also functioning on something else visually. I feel like I'm all, almost, there's a connection that happens where I'm almost working to uh, keep my body in a neutral position. And that in essence makes me stronger in the moment because I have two different adaptations going on. Does that make sense? It makes sense. and. I think I understand I understand what it is you're mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. Now, I do think I I have to like preface by telling people that first of all, humans are not very good multitaskers by nature. We're this not is true. we're not meant yeah. to, we're not meant to multitask. <laughs> um, we're meant to focus on one or two things at a time. However, when multitasking is a natural part of life and like the example that you just used essentially essentially being able to do those types of things and do them effectively and again like i said like as we get older do simple multitasking effectively mm -hmm. that shows our ability to basically distribute resources efficiently mm -hmm. to different parts of the brain that are active mm -hmm. and it's a reduced ability to distribute what resources we have efficiently as we grow older reduced ability um, to do that 
basically results in a worse cognitive outcomes. And that could be, you could be talking about dementia or increasing your risk for falls, mm -hmm. which we know when that happens, you know, if somebody breaks a hip, that's almost a death sentence um, oh, yeah. as a senior citizen. Oh yeah, absolutely. And while we're on the topic of training, we talked about a few things off mic, a lot of things off mic actually while we were, you know, setting up, but in, we talked about video games and training and visual training and, and neurosensory training. You know, I think that the millennials, younger people, and in, in, you said you still play some video games. I mean, there's got to be a great deal of upside with the ability, with cognitive function, training yourself with that much commitment um, or feedback for the brain playing those video games. It's not all negative. Would that be correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's not all negative. And yeah, I love playing video games. Mm -hmm. I, it's it's one way for me to, you know, in the chaos of my life, be able to connect with my brothers. I okay. hop on Xbox Live and, okay. you know, we jump on Call of Duty together or whatever. Okay. And, um, but, you know, they, they're not mindless activities. There's mm -hmm. actually a high degree of brain activity going on. And like we talked off mic, there's plenty of research supporting that, you um, I guess I don't want to say plenty, but there's more research now supporting that kids who played video games um, or children that played video games as young adults mm -hmm. um, actually score better on working memory and recall tests. And then also older individuals who are also given video games as a way of some kind of like cognitive training actually are able to stave off mental deterioration yeah. with time. So in most cases any kind of intense brain activity i don't say increased brain activity with video games a lot as long as you understand what you're doing it for it does confer benefit mm -hmm. um you know brain activity is good activity obviously unless it's in excess then mm -hmm. you know you but you know let's we're talking about video games yeah. just the brain activity that video games can cause yes it can become addicting but yes it can also be highly positive as well mm -hmm. it also actually works the heart and the heart rate meaning uh i'll give you an example a friend of mine uh, had their son playing video games and he was having massive anxiety she put her heart rate monitor on her son and his heart rate went through the roof when he was playing call of duty <laughs> I'm not surprised. That, I thought that was an incredible uh, response yeah. to a video game. I mean, he was seated. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean, I guess hey, it can be it can be multi. Uh, yeah, multifunctional. Maybe a a light form of cardiovascular yeah. work, if that's how you look at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've monopolized a, a ton of Will's time. I, I have a couple more questions for you, Will. Could you? I know you have to understand what the intention is but for overall brain health would there be could i ask for top five supplements or the ones that you you appreciate the most okay so i think there are a couple supplements not just not just for brain health but overall health but mm -hmm. do they translate to brain health yeah. yeah there's i think four that i tell people hey you can take these for year round okay. with pretty much you know no chance of side effects assuming you're using recommended doses and then after that it does become based on the individual and then, okay. you know, my most appreciated would probably mm -hmm. be different than your most appreciated. Mm -hmm. But excuse me, generally speaking, I think that most people can take, uh, obviously coming from a good source, but omega-3, mm -hmm. omega-3 fatty acids, creatine, mm -hmm. which is one that I think young or old can, and in a lot of cases should be taking vitamin D. Um, let's see what else. Every now, now this one isn't one I would take all the time, but I take it two to three times a week, and that's a quality B vitamin mm -hmm. with the bioactive forms of some of the B vitamins. Like an example is you typically see folic acid, B9 in the form of folic acid. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 to 80% of the population can't effectively use that form of B9. So, mm -hmm. you know, I like to make sure that the appropriate forms of the vitamins are in those things, but two to three times a week, I use a B vitamin. Okay. And then the last one, why is it escaping? What I say? Vitamin D, creatine. Choline? No, see, choline is one that, that would be one that for myself personally, I say mm -hmm. is like one that's not appreciated enough. That's certainly a okay. nutrient that is not appreciated enough. Mm -hmm. And you 
no, it's not appreciated enough because in Europe they have no guidelines established, no dietary guidelines established for it. Um, and it might be one of one of the main drivers of long-term cognitive deterioration by not getting enough choline. Oh. But at the same time, it's so it's so easy to get that from your diet, mm-hmm. assuming you're just paying attention to what you're eating. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're largely plant bla- plant based or vegetarian or vegan, then that could that might mean you would have to take the course of supplementation with choline. Mm-hmm. And even in certain situations, I like supplementing with it, but I do find that when I'm just being mindful of my day in day out diet, it's easy enough to get enough choline. And obviously choline is mostly abundant in animal proteins, mm-hmm. eggs, fish, red meats. But for people that aren't eating that, then you can get it from other places like uh, sunflower or soy lecithin. Mm-hmm. However, I don't know many people that are largely plant-based that have like a high intake of those things. So maybe in that case, you would need to supplement with choline. Okay. Um, But for myself personally, things that I love to supplement with regularly, Mm -hmm. outside of the ones that I just mentioned, and Mm -hmm. I know that I'm forgetting one, but... Is there ashwagandha? Ashwagandha. (laughs) Ashwagandha. Thank you. Tell us about it. Okay. So I I noticed this on your page and you, 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 you hit on it often. Ash, well, I get asked about it often okay. because it's a popular one. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any particular special feelings about it, but ashwagandha is its an herb that's been used in Ayurvedic medicine, so traditional medicine for you know probably before written history even existed. Mm-hmm. And it's been used for infertility, for anxiety, for improving sleep. I mean, a lot of those herbs that are, have been used in traditional medicine, especially Ayur, with the Ayurvedic classification, mm-hmm they're almost used for everything under the sun Mm. but with all this popularity and all the research on ashwagandha and there's different types of patented ashwagandha with different levels of actives in it um which by the way if you want an effective ashwagandha you should make sure that it is standardized um to a certain level of active ingredient and you know you may be able to get some benefit from just the raw extract Mm. but you know make sure which the ones that you're buying if you want to get benefit do have a standardization of so you know that there's actually active ingredient inside of it but anyways so there is actually research for it being able to improve um, testosterone levels in men who were um, let's say a little hypogonadal so Mm -hmm. didn't have adequate levels of testosterone it does seem to increase sperm quality and count in men it does help reduce parameters of depression in some people improve anxiety Mm -hmm. and it also when taken regularly uh, at night or when taken regularly twice a day I should say actually does uh, equate to better sleep outcomes in people and that might be due to its ability to lower cortisol over time so people do tend to take ashwagandha thinking they'll just drop their cortisol Mm -hmm. but um, that's one that you need to take for a couple weeks and then you know over the course of time you start to see lowering of cortisol which for a lot of people would probably equate to better sleep outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's a popular herb that's used for a lot of things. Um, I like using it. I like to go through spurts where I'll use it for four to eight weeks and particularly during extra stressful times in my life to just kind of a keep stress low as low as possible and prevent cortisol spikes Mm -hmm. during that time and to keep my sleep intact. So that, that those seem to be what it's most beneficial for. Understood. Did you have any more in your own personal supplement list that you want to mention? One that I use frequently that people who follow my stuff know that I talk about a lot uh, is lithium. And I know that like lithium kind of when you say it, it kind of like takes people back. Like, right, oh, right. that's either you know that. Mike that, Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like a lot of times it's it's uh, people make the relation to like manic manic depressive disorders okay. where it's it's normally prescribed for it's a first it's a first line of defense prescription mm-hmm. um people also you know hear the term lithium batteries but sure you know lithium itself is a mineral uh and what's really interesting is that there's been research that's been accumulating for years now and it just keeps backing itself up now this is all epidemiological data so you can't you can't assume causation. Mm-hmm. However, the evidence itself is pretty compelling that there are different countries, not only different towns, but different whole countries have been studied and they've all found the same thing that in areas 
with lower levels of lithium in drinking water because typically you know we have low very low levels of lithium in regular tap water but mm. a with the elimination of tap water from most people's lives and which i still agree with for the most point because i mean if you get a filter and you run water through it sometimes you'd be amazed at what that filter catches so but with more people doing that and more people getting their water from their fridge where it's already pre-filtered lithium levels are going down in people lithium intakes going down in people and in and in countries and in parts of those countries where there's less lithium in drinking water there is there are higher rates of suicides mm -hmm. and so lithium obviously it's been used to help treat people with bipolar disorder but mm -hmm. that's been in very high doses mm -hmm. so the lithium that i take is in the microgram range mm -hmm. like people and that's you know almost hundreds to almost a thousand times lower Okay. than what somebody is taking like a prescription say having to take it for a bipolar or a manic disorder got it but i like taking anywhere from 300 micrograms up to a thousand micrograms or one milligram and it, people can take it safely up to mm -hmm. five milligrams but that one itself not only has it been associated with reduced depression and suicide rates but there's also cell data showing that it actually stabilizes the activity of neurons, which is why it might be effective for people with bipolar disorder because oh. it, it prevents over excitations and then over depressions and just helps keeps things firing and more in a more stable manner. Okay. But also it does show that it inhibits certain enzymes that over time start to upregulate the misfolding of proteins that may result in something like Alzheimer's disease. So we'll just throw out, there's an example, there's one enzyme, it's called GSK3, and over time it increases with activity, and its increase in activity creates the accumulation of what's called tau proteins, and mm -hmm. tau is something that we know is highly associated with people with Alzheimer's disease, it builds up becomes toxic to cells and then neurodegeneration starts happening around it. So lithium inhibits this enzyme and slows its activity to where it's not causing an over accumulation of these misfolded and damaging proteins, at least mm -hmm. damaging in the amounts um, that they're found in in people mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's disease. So lithium, not only do I, now maybe it's just a placebo effect. Mm -hmm. I do feel like I'm a little bit more like constantly stable when i'm on it like i said like in very very low doses mm -hmm. um and also i feel like i'm doing myself some good long term from it and like mm -hmm. now whether that's a placebo or not i'll live with it mm -hmm. because a placebo effect is still in effect and that's that's how i look right, at it right. so lithium is one of those is one of those that i take regularly that i tell other people that they can take regularly and be safe about but not one that they may necessarily have to. But if you're interested in supplementing with it, it's you know safe and low, safe and low levels. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, people are often surprised to hear that I really don't supplement with a whole lot of things, and especially not continuously. Like my needs change from day to day. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of days that go by that I'm not taking. Uh, I'm almost never taking the same thing every day unless it's a high quality omega three. I mean, I even for myself, I find that my blood levels of vitamin D are stable if I'm taking it three to four times a week. So mm -hmm. I don't even take vitamin D every week. I don't take a B vitamin every or sorry every day of the week. Um, so I think omega threes and creatine are probably the two things that I'm pretty mm -hmm. consistent on every day. And outside of that, you know, I'll like I said, I'll supplement with things like choline if I feel like wow, my diet has consisted mostly of say egg whites and fruits today mm -hmm. just because I'm so busy with work that I can't I don't cook anything I'll mm -hmm. just drink egg whites or something right, right. and I'll be like I need some choline so you know in that case I'll supplement with choline to right. to meet my daily needs okay. and then if I feel like I'm not getting enough you know polyphenols in that day because you know I do put my work first and yeah. everything sometimes to my own detriment yeah I hear you so I'll, every now and then I'll you know then I'll, if I feel like I need some polyphenol intake then i'll supplement with a, a quality curcumin or a pine bark extract or something well uh, are there any uh supplement companies that you recommend that that you think are highly reputable so the one that i do work for now life extension we're located in fort lauderdale florida mm -hmm. um that is by far of any company that to this point in my life i have had dealings with they have the highest integrity 
which is why I work for them and which is why I enjoy working for them. Like I don't get any, I don't get anything out of recommending people go there. I just, because I'm so involved in the product development, I I know exactly what's in the products. So I know if I'm telling somebody, okay, you can take this product and I, I feel confident recommending that to you because I know what's in it and what's in it is what the label says is in it. Okay, great. And the website is lifeextension.com? Lifeextension.com, I believe, yes. Okay, awesome. Last question. What three things would you recommend to have, uh, to sustain, maintain, and have a long-term positive uh, brain health, brain health in general? Well, I think we talked about the first most obvious thing. Like the first thing we talked about was sleep. Oh, yeah. But I think that, you know, I guess, you know, we got to tie up here, but to just give people like an indication, I mean, sleep doesn't only help us learn, but it regulates our affect. So our emotional state day in and day out. And if we don't get enough sleep, like even losing one to two hours of sleep a night after a period of three days, people start report reporting feeling mm-hmm. less positive emotions, mm-hmm. though that doesn't necessarily relate to feeling more negative emotions. It does relate to handling negative emotions worse. Or there's other studies that show that with slight sleep deprivation, and that's literally only losing an hour or two of sleep over the course of a couple nights in a row. And right. how many of us do that right. like during the week? So less positive emotion, handling negative emotion and negative situations worse. And not only that, but if you have children, sleep deprivation in adults, uh, lower sleep, sorry, shorter durations of sleep in adults mm-hmm. regularly mm-hmm. has actually been tied. And again, this is just correlation, but it's been tied to psychopathologies in their children, depression, anxiety, and uh, even schizophrenia. So wait a minute here. So you're saying that uh, an adult who's sleep deprived passes that on through their kids uh, through birth or once they're already alive? No, when they're, once they're alive. So okay. I was saying, you know, if, if you are not sleeping well as a parent, then likely that's affect, that is affecting your emotional state in a negative way. And in ways that you might not be aware of, it is probably affecting the emotional health of your children. So, oh, and now think if you, have, if you live in a two-parent household, if one parent's sleep hygiene is off, it could be throwing the other parent's sleep hygiene right. off. And now not only do you have two parties that are in, say, let's just say, a not optimal emotional state, and how does that affect your children's health? We don't tend to think about that, but there have been studies that have related all those things. So you're telling me if I have two hardworking parents that are sleep deprived, the kid's going to be a serial killer? I hope not. but. <laughs> depressed maybe okay <laughs> not and also well they won't be sleeping as well likely oh, i'm sure but i mean at a minimum there's a worry for them being depressed and anxious mm-hmm. um and, and not feeling well themselves mm-hmm. so if, if you can't get your own sleep cool. habits in line for yourself then you know for the sake of your children if you okay. have them got it all right so the first one sleep the second one would be the second one is obviously nutrition and again okay. we have to go with these like boring no, like you know they need to hear it really. but literally like it really is as simple as getting in a couple servings a week of fruits and but i think now every right. day you should get a certain amount of servings of vegetables and stuff but like making sure that you're actually getting a couple servings of fruits and vegetables that are giving you high levels of say antioxidants mm. and polyphenols mm. and dark berries berries right dark berries are a good source of that okay um like i mean i i have blueberries every day blueberries are an absolute staple for me Mm -hmm. um you know banana watermelon like those those are all organic to be honest no to be honest no i don't really feel like (sighs) okay i want to hear it i don't really feel like it really makes that big a difference now if if you You don't want to give you money to whole foods man whole foods is so expensive (laughs) it's so expensive so expensive. I got a chicken breast from the other day. It was like fifteen dollars. Jeez, like a, that's one chicken breast. No, I mean, thank it, was, you. it was huge. But which leads me to my next thing. Is I don't want to get off topic, but I don't know how natural it was. A jack chicken. <laughs> it was a jack it chicken. It must have been. Yeah. I hope that it's like passing some of that, oh, passing some yeah. of that on to you. I know. I know. Okay. So berries, non organic. You were saying. Uh, well, I, sh- I would also tell people like now, if you have the option to get it from like a farmer's market or this and that, yeah. well, you know, then obviously that's that's best case yeah. scenario. Okay. Now I don't, 
I don't freak out about buying non-organic. Is it the most optimal thing? No. Mm -hmm. But do I have enough things in line where I think it's doing me real harm? Not necessarily. Your body's pretty efficient at processing things. Um, As long as you're, you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's in, you know, as many areas as you can, then, you know, you're probably not buying organic isn't probably going to kill you in the end. Got it. There's enough okay. other things I can do that. It's crazy. Three? Exercise. Exercise. And, and, and I'm glad you said that because there was something I forgot to ask you. There was a study, or I actually uh, it was a pic I saw of uh, a, a, tri- a long, a, a career triathlete's brain with adipose tissue. Say that one more time. It was, a, it was the, the difference in the brain tissue of a triathlete, mm-hmm. meaning that someone who's done who's been an active and been an athlete for years or a triathlete with that, that long distance cardio mm-hmm. they had. I can't remember if it was less or more adipose tissue in their brain. So your brain is primarily made of fat. Mm-hmm. Your, your brain is the fattiest, mm-hmm. the fattiest organ in the body. Okay. So I'm not sure if maybe they were looking at like maybe muscle, like maybe, the intra, maybe, intra, maybe. intra muscular fat storage possibly, or something like that. Possibly. Um, but I think that a good way to like sum up those two. So obviously you've, you know, nutrition and exercise. And I think that we can classify those underneath uh, metabolic challenges. Mm -hmm. So like there's, there's 10, I think that right now there's 10 agreed upon um, hallmarks of say brain aging, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And the things that seem to be able to help alleviate just about all of those or touch on them. Well, Hey, they're all related to uh, altered metabolism in the brain so the things that we can do to help stave off those hallmarks of brain aging are metabolic challenge and those metabolic challenges are say exercise and also um say and we talked about earlier caloric restriction Mm -hmm. is a type of metabolic challenge Mm -hmm. and then also intellectual challenge so what kinds of things are you doing to maybe say train like brain we say i call it brain training and maybe that's playing strategy video games maybe that's it, maybe that's incorporating skill-based training into your workout routine. Could it be something as simple as someone who never ever picks up a book and reads reading? It really could be that simple sometimes. Like mm-hmm. the best, honestly, like the best advice, the the one piece of advice, if somebody put a gun to my head and was like one piece of advice to maintain brain health, mm-hmm. I'm like, you use it, use your brain. Mm-hmm. You know, I th- and this was recognized as far back as Socrates. Socrates said, you know, people give up much more readily when it comes to training their mind than they do when training their physical body. And that's true. He also said, don't be lame in your love of hard work. So a lot of times you see people like they love one aspect of hard work. That is, they love going to the gym and shooting for PRs and putting themselves under all kind of physical duress in that state. But then when it comes to getting serious about, say, if you're a student and it comes to getting serious about your studying or serious yeah. about like sitting down and really putting in deep work into mm-hmm. something then you're like ah, oh, it's too hard like it's like yeah. look you just you just went out and exposed your muscles to a high degree of stress right. but you're shying away from doing it to your brain and it's, if it's good for your muscles it should so be good for your brain that's so interesting you say that because i was thinking you know how many times i hear a, a human being say that's really not my thing and i say look if it's not your thing that's cool no one should be forced to do something that they hate but do you understand that you're negotiating with yourself and you're trying to get yourself to believe it's not your thing when that's not really the situation you're trying to get away from something you dislike whereas going through the thing that you dislike will actually help you grow so much more it's a potential cop out oh, absolutely you know it's i think a that cop-out. I, I don't do that i mean that that i just you just told me you're lazy you're lazy you need to do it but they don't believe that I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I was I thought about this the other day when I was having a conversation with somebody. Was, we talk about all the positive things you can get from being in the gym, mm-hmm. like the training your mental state, mm-hmm. assuming that's what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, but so many people get addicted to the gym, but then they, 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 they wake up really early and they make their whole life about fitness and they realize they're not progressing in other areas of life. It's like, well, maybe you're you're just being lame in your love of hard work and you're working really hard here as a way of compensating 
and hiding from not working hard in other Jeez. areas of your life. So you, you feel you feel good, like you've accomplished something, which you have, mm-hmm. but if you accomplish nothing outside of that, then what have you accomplished at, right. at all? So you know, you've know you done something to make yourself feel good, and then you use that as a cover up to not work hard in other areas and be like, no, you know, I'm, I'm a hard worker. You know, like I, I kicked ass in the gym today. Yeah, you kicked ass in one thing. Like what about yeah. your career path? What about your relationship? Exactly. Like what about exactly. school? You know, my wife's gonna appreciate that one. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's like if you if you can go if you know that exposing your muscles to high degrees of stress for a certain amount of time in certain limits can get positive adaptations. Mm-hmm. The same thing can be said for your brain. So how do you keep optimal brain health? You use the damn thing. Awesome. Listen, Will, I can't thank you enough for being on. This was amazing. Please tell everyone where they can find you and follow you and, and how they can get access to your information. Um, I'm primarily active on Instagram. I have a Twitter. I'm trying to be more active there, but mm-hmm. Twitter, especially in today's landscape, is just so – that's bad for my own mental health. <laughs> so I'll go – like I might post the link to his study and then, okay. and then walk away. But okay. um, at Will the Wallace is where you can find me, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, yeah. So shoot me a message if you need me. Awesome. Awesome. I really can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you man. very much. Yeah. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you.